everybody thinks of technology and they go, oh, it's so boring, it's so technical, so difficult. But I would like to think that we made it easier, we made it a little bit more fun. Your various social media platforms are still very important, but we need to start looking at how we engage our audiences offline and then incorporate the digital aspect into it. I mean, you know, when Facebook first started, it was very much a young person's product, a uh, young product's platform. But today, increasingly, it's the older people who are using it and younger people have moved off into different platforms. Hello and welcome to the Gross Genius Series brought to you by DMA Asia and Infidigit. My name is Shelley and I'm the Country Director Americas at Infidigit. I'm also the Founder and Director at DMA Asia. In this Growth Senior Series, the world's best marketeers and business leaders are interviewed about the brands they have worked on, their successful campaign strategies, how they got noticed by their customers, and how they delivered better customer experiences to drive growth. In each episode, we want to share the big idea that inspires these marketeers, the campaign trail they used to execute it, and how it all came together. Today, our guest is Adrian Hang, an international communications and marketing professional with over 20 years of experience. Adrian is a founder of Merlot Consulting. As a senior counsel for the consultancy, he now works with startups, SMEs, MNCs, NPOs, and government agencies, advising on their growth strategies, as well as helping build their brand recognition, effectively engaging their target audience to achieve their strategic objectives. Having worked with some of the world's leading consultancies and multiple companies, leading global teams, Adrian has won several international awards along the way. He also mentors several young and aspiring professionals. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you, Shelley. Great to be here. Great. So you have 20 years of experience in marketing and communication. Please tell us how your professional journey unfolded. Okay. So I started as a fresh graduate, not really knowing what I wanted to do. I was fortunate enough to be hired by Ogilvy, what used to be called Ogilvy and Meta Public Relations then, uh, as a fresh consultant working in the technology practice, uh, which was at that point in time booming. And I think at that point of time, also people trying to figure out, okay, what do we do in terms of um, communicating technology? Because everybody thinks of technology and they go, oh, it's so boring, it's so technical, so difficult. Um, but I would like to think that we made it easier. We made it a little bit more fun. And since then, I've been fortunate enough to go from consultancy into the client space, very often an actual client from the consultancy. So when I leave a consultancy, one of my clients will look me up and go, hey, Adrian, will you come work for us? It's been a great ride. Wouldn't change it for the world. Um, it's opened a lot of doors from becoming an adjunct associate professor for National University of Singapore, to chairing various um, advisory boards for different organizations, including in NUS, and now with another startup association in Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, it's taken me around the world and back, working in the US, working global campaigns, and just trying to have fun along the way, meeting lots of great people and great mentors. And without them, I think I wouldn't be here um, today. That's great, Adrian. So do you think that the pandemic has changed the marketing industry? What are some of the significant growth drivers for the brands? When the pandemic started about three years ago, the world saw extensive lockdowns and restrictions to people. Organizations quickly shifted to a digital century approach to continue to try to engage the audiences because everybody was home and you know everybody was either on their laptops, computers or mobile phones or other digital devices. This has been great in many, many ways. Marketing teams have been able to develop their digital skills, like in analytics, search, social media, and lots of other areas, which has been a long time coming, especially in the areas of analytics. But I think with the lifting of restrictions, people are increasingly getting out of their homes and offices to live their lives again. So this is pushing marketing teams to add back to the channels mix beyond just digital out-of-home advertising, events, public relations, 
fun activities where conferences, uh, games, a lot of different things. So this is something that's born out of need. And I think this is going to be increasingly more and more important. And But marketing teams are still trying to catch up to it because I think there was a huge investment into digital space because all of us didn't know how long this pandemic was going to last. I mean, some of the worst predictions was that it was going to last five years or more. So the need to shift back into non-digital activities has taken a little longer than I think is necessary. Companies need to move a lot quicker. Google search is, fun, is great. Your various social media platforms are still very important, but we need to start looking at how we engage our audiences offline and then incorporate the digital aspect into it. Yeah, these are great points. So can this be an opportunity for the organizations? Oh, definitely. I think it's a great opportunity for us uh, marketing people and organizations as a whole to we look at our audiences and what they want from us. Three years is a very, very long time in terms of marketing and business today. People change, expectations change, needs change. So it's opportunity for us to look at afresh how we want to engage our audiences. What do our audiences want from us in terms of what do they, what sort of products they want, what sort of services they want? How do they want us to engage with them? Like I was saying earlier, I think increasingly they don't want just digital, they want to see us out and about, right next to them, when they're on the streets, when they're out at events, um, when they're having dinner. How do we start to change that marketing mix where we effectively find them and engage them where they are? Yes, I think you're very right that customers were really wanting to, they were hoping for the human connection again. They wanted to go out and shop exactly. and they wanted to touch and feel and try exactly. things. So that was missing, but now they really want that. So what do marketers need to consider when embarking on this uh, new old normal? I think they need to understand again what the audiences want. And from organization to organization differs. From a lot of consumer brands, I think people, as you mentioned, as they're out about, they want to touch and feel, they want to engage with people. So the brick and mortar stores, I think we'll see increasingly more and more people coming back. I think one new concept might be people might not actually buy at the brick and mortar store, hmm. but they will go in, they will try, they'll touch, they'll feel, they'll test. I think increasingly we'll see more concept stores where yeah. you might not need stores everywhere and every street corner, but where people can, strategic locations where people can go in, the feel of the cloth, try the new vacuum cleaner or maybe even taste certain things if restrictions allow us to do the tasting and touching. Then they get to feel, okay, this is what it is in real life. And then go back, think about it. Okay, I really like it. And then go to the online store and buy it. How do we bridge that gap? How do we make it possible for these people? At the same time, I think with the digital being great in terms of collecting information, in terms of bringing information to people to exactly where they are. We need to look at how, you know, if somebody goes into the store and tries to certain something, or if they're out and about at an event, how do we bring the digital outreach into the experience as well? So maybe at a store, it could be, oh, you know, if you like this particular thing, you can scan a QR code and save it into your shopping cart so you can think about it and buy it later. Or it could be, you know, you're at an event where it's a lot of fun, it's a lot of interesting. How do you take that event, expand experience a little bit more? How do we have the event continue post-event? So after the event, they could be re uh, receiving digital messages or they could be, hey, you at this event, thank you for coming. Here are a couple of things you could do off of your phone to learn more or or if you like that, this particular speaker, he, you know, here's a white paper that the speaker that you might find interesting. And if you want to take it further, we have experts that can take you a little bit, uh, give you a little bit more information, invite you for a meeting, organize something for you to continue that experience. 
And this is something I think not enough organizations are doing. And mm. I'll add one last thing is that with this new old normal, especially after the pandemic, people want to go out and laugh again, smile, mm. enjoy themselves a little bit. I think increasingly organizations, and it's not just the consumer or the fund brands, but the more traditional brands or more B2B brands, we need to look at we give that audience, our audience, a little bit of fun, a little bit of laughter. I think any brand that makes their audience smile, in a good way, of course, not in a bad way, but smile or laugh and go, hey, this is enjoyable. It is one step into winning your audience over and keeping your audience involved, engaged, and keeping the brand top of mind. That's very right. I think that uh, uh, the human element uh, should always be there while communicating with your customers. So can you share any campaign which really inspired you and uh, you were really impressed by it, uh, which was okay. done in Singapore or any other market? Okay. Um, so this was a campaign, sounds a little egoistic, but this was a campaign I actually did a lot, many years ago, uh, well, not many years ago, a few years ago for a microchip company. Okay. So this microchip company is, was number two to the big, uh, the big brand. And I won't say who it was because you never talk about competitors, right? Um, so for a long time, they were struggling to get the message out that their microprocessors was good, as good as the leader in the market. At that particular point, they were, in fact, better than the leader in certain areas. But because they've been seen as second choice in that sense, um, it was a challenge for them to get their message out. So one of, they were starting to run ads in the press in the US about, oh, you know, we are now as good as the leader. And the press imagery they gave was of a boxing ring. You know, we can match the leader in um, X, Y, and Z now. So when my client showed me those ads, I was like, oh, this is really interesting. And I asked, how about if we take this one step further? And she uh, and my client goes, what do you mean? So like, you know, you're saying that your product is as good as the leader, if not better. Why don't we do comparison tests in public? You know, usually these are all done in the back, in the back room somewhere. So I said, let's do it in public. And the initial reaction was, hey, Adrian, this has never been done. You know, we people don't do comparison things in public. But I said, no, people do, you know. People do blindfold tests for soft drinks mm. or food. Mm. Uh, so why don't we take that consumer brand idea and do it in a technology space, which is traditionally never been done. So after some discussions, in fact, a lot of discussions, we finally got to execute it. So we did it as an event. We invited media. We invited chief editor for technology publication to be the impartial judge. Uh, we brought in various business partners that use the microchip so that we can compare based on their systems, the two different processes, how will be the performance. Hmm. To get the word out further, we uh, leverage digital media so we put the word out there that, hey, we're doing this comparison study. If you happen to be in the area and you're interested, please drop by and check it out. We were very naughty in that we went and bought table space at the food court nearest to the competitor and stuck stickers on the table saying that, hey, we're doing this challenge at this time at this place. We challenged this other brand to come down. So word got out. The forums, people started talking about it, which was great. And on that day itself, when we were having that event, we started get. we had a lot of press show up. Some of them were from overseas. We hadn't even invited. They found out about it. They said, you know, we want to come. So we were like, sure, please do. But on the, at the event itself, we had a room at Risk Houghton. We had a lot of strangers come in. Yeah. So we were expecting, you know, a few people, maybe three, four, five people to show up geeks and all that who might be interested. But we ended up having a lot of people. This was great. Until then, we saw a guy in army uniform standing in the back and we're like, okay, what's the army doing here? And we, so after a bit of discussion, I was nominated to go up to the guy and go, 
hi, could I help you? And he goes, oh, no, you know, I saw the chatter on digital media. Um, so I took a bit of time off from my army duties to come out and check out the event. Wow. <laughs> Very effectively got the word out. And because it was done in such a fun manner, but still got the point across mm. um, very strongly, especially when the competitor chose not to show up to the challenge. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, because we, although we invited them, they, they didn't have to come, right? Yeah. Uh, so they chose not to come. Mm. But by doing so, it, you know, it amplified the message that, hey, this brand now, the product is as good as the competitor, if not better. Because if the product wasn't as good as the competitor, the competitor will show up and show that, hey, my product is better than everybody else. Uh, but because they didn't show, everybody started talking, oh, wow, you know, looks like this brand, this new microprocessors are as good as anything else in the market. And the press picked it up, picked up on it. The press talked to the people in the room, you know, are you excited about this product, et cetera, et cetera. And after that, you know, people were talking about it, digital media, et cetera. And to, I guess, be very, again, bring that smile and that laughter into the uh, activity, we published uh, 10 reasons why the competitor didn't show up. And it was all done in tongue in cheek. So we made jokes about it and et cetera. But it got the point across. Yeah. And people remembered. So there are some people I still meet, some geeks I still meet, and some technology publishers I still meet. And they still talk about it. Oh, you know, that event you did. That was very lucky of you, but we had a lot of fun. So the message got through. We engaged the audience successfully. And because it was holistic, so we did out-of-home advertising, the tables. We did digital media. We did a particular event. We did follow-ups after that. Uh, so I think this is where the, the new old normal has to go to. We have to make it fun for people again. We have to make it interesting for people again. And it has to be done out of homes. Obviously, they didn't buy any product then because we weren't selling a product at the event. But people went, oh, you know, this is great. And we saw increase in sales interest from the client. So this is what we need to do. What would have happened if your competitors would have arrived? <laughs> we were quite confident that our products would have, uh, the products would have been just as good, if not better. Yeah. Um, because obviously we did our own testing before the <laughs> event happened. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And we did get some third parties to, to um, qualify our results. So we we're fairly confident that we would have been at least as good as. Hmm. So, as you know, very often lawyers, um, something the lawyers often say, don't ask a question unless you already know the answer. Hmm. Same thing. We already knew the answer that our product would be just as good. Yeah, great. So that's a great example. Do you think that there are any pitfalls that the marketers need to be careful of now is the consumer behavior has changed a lot after pandemic and it's still very unpredictable whether they like to go to digital or whether they want to do the physical stores you know people are still trying to figure it out that uh, how should they plan their marketing uh, campaigns there are a lot of and there are several things that marketers need to look out for Hmm. Um, actually, I would say, I'll go even further to say there are several things organizations should look out for. One, I think with the pandemic where we were very digital centric, it was very easy to put whatever we want to say on social media or on digital media. Um, but now that we are trying to expand beyond social media, etc., we need to be very careful that what we put out in real life matches with what we do on digital. So the two things have to mesh. I take it one step further, whatever we do, whatever we say, uh, the campaigns that we run on digital media has to be in sync with what we do in traditional outreach as well. You can't do two distinctly different campaigns. They have to be holistic, they have to merge, they have to support each other. I think this is something that a lot of marketers have kind of started to forget, where there's a digital team and they want to go do their own thing, and then the new uh, traditional people want to do their own thing. You need somebody to ensure that everything gels together. 
And this is something that uh, I think organizations should be careful of. Increasingly, I see a lot of organizations, um, especially startups, I think, due to cost constraints, they tend to hire younger and younger people as their head of marketing, as their CMOs. In fact, the other, um, a year plus ago, I met a CMO that was 28 years old. <laughs> um, and I'm sure she's very capable. Yeah. I'm sure she was very smart. But with marketing, you do need a certain amount of experience, a certain amount of exposure. I understand organizations, especially startups, are trying to save costs. But in the long run, this would actually hurt them because without the sufficient experience, without sufficient exposure, you might not be getting as much bang for your buck in that sense. Uh, you might be trapped in certain areas that somebody with more experience would go, oh no, you cannot do that because you know people will be unhappy. Young professionals are great. You know, A lot of them are smart, way smarter than what I was many years ago, but they want to do a lot of things. They are very aggressive and good for them in many ways. But sometimes you know what you need to know where that line is, where audiences will accept and where audiences won't. Uh, the other thing is with some young marketing professionals, they are very set into the mindset of, okay, I want to reach out to a particular age group, which is an age group that they are very familiar with. Yeah. And depending on the product or brand, sometimes that might not be the age group that you want to go after. Yeah. That's it. Older people sometimes also fall into that trap. So my suggestion is maybe you need to look at a mix of people or at least somebody who's open-minded enough to look at who the audience is. Again, going back to, you know, the opportunity. Who the audience is? What the audience wants? How do we reach them? You know? Pink, yellow, and green might not work for everybody. It really needs to fall back into who your audience is. Um, organizations need to look at that. Marketers need to look at that. Organization leaders, business leaders also need to be aware of that as well. That's right. In fact, you know, you so truly said that uh, we sometimes uh, stereotype, you know, that yes. oh, only this age group will love this product yes. you know that exactly. people above 61 might like it but you never exactly. know right so there have been so exactly. many examples where people who have been marketers who have been bold and they yes. did some experimentation they were surprised mm -hmm. with the outcome you know yes. and this is where analytics help but also as products evolve as well i mean you know when facebook first started it was very much a young person's product yes. <laughs> a young products platform but today Increasingly, it's the older people who are using it and younger people have moved off into different platforms. Exactly. So you never know how the platform evolve. evolves, right? Exactly. Exactly. We're, we never know how the products evolve. Yeah, that's very valid. My next question is that what advice would you give to the younger marketing professionals? Okay. Uh, you know, what's your advice to them? Sure. I talk to a lot of young professionals, people I mentor or, you know, when I'm hiring people and all of them, okay, I won't say all of them, a very high portion of them all come in and says, Adrian, I want to do digital. <laughs> I think that's very exciting and that's where I'm familiar with. And that's great. You know, it, it's good that you are cognizant of where you could add value to the company, where your experiences, where your knowledge can make things better for the company. But I think at the same time, if you are looking to grow in the profession, if you want to be CMO one day, if you want to be head of marketing, vice president of marketing, vice president of communications, whatever it may be, even CEO, you need to go beyond just digital. Mm. You need to know how to do out of homes. You need to know how PR works, how communications works how events work for you um, and how it works for the brand. If you're just doing digital, eventually you technique. And who's to say five years, 10 years from now, digital might not be what it is today. You know, it might, you know, things have changed. Many years ago, many, many, many years ago, advertising was be all and, you know, and all. But today advertising is starting to struggle a little bit. But how do we, merge digital with advertising? How do we merge uh, communications or PR with 
digital with advertising. This is something that's critical, especially at a higher level, where you need to have this holistic view of how do I reach my audience? It's not platform centric anymore. You do need to understand different platforms. You need to know how they work, how they are effective in terms of outreach, in terms of engaging people, what are the strengths. But at the end of the day is what you need to know is who your audience is. And then how do we best reach these people? That is, I think, my biggest advice for young people coming into the, our profession today. Don't get so fixated in digital that that's all you want to do. Look at gaining as much experience and as much exposure in different platforms as you can. That's very right what you said because, you know, on my other episode, I was interviewing one B2B marketing leader and uh, so this is what I was asking her that, do you think there's a death of a traditional salesperson? Because now young people, they just want to text and, you know, message and then they don't want to talk. They don't want to go face to face. And uh, she said, yeah, but ultimately what's important is the relationship, right? Relationships still count in B2B marketing, especially yes. you have to build relations and you can't yes. build relations just by staying on phone. Yes. As you as you pointed out, the human element is still very important. Exactly. And the young people don't realize it, but you know, even though they're on their phones and they're on their computers, they still go and read coffee. They still go and have <laughs> lunch and dinner with their friends. Yes. Um, so the human element still plays a huge part in what we do in marketing. And that's something that we need to inculcate in the younger professionals. And that's something that the younger professionals need to take on that challenge for. Great. So this brings us to the last segment of this interview. So tell us sure. about any passions you follow other than your work and sure. you're teaching the young generation to un how do you unwind and also stay inspired? Wow. Um, I think one of the things I, I read a lot, um, uh, I, a lot of people, a lot, especially the young professionals don't really read anymore. It's a lot of YouTube, but I still enjoy reading a good book, a good magazine. I think being able to learn about different areas, whether it's in medical, is it technology, is it women's fashion, I think it is important for any marketer because this opens up your mind, this opens up your experience. And you know, I've stolen lots of ideas from luxury brands and taking them over to technology and vice versa because that works and by the same time as a marketer we work very hard so you for me it's a lot of things i do i try to do for fun from photography to i used to teach taekwondo uh, martial arts uh, i still run exercise uh, i travel uh, in fact you know I, I, tomorrow i hop on the plane and i'm headed back to germany uh, to go visit the christmas markets I think all of these things adds to a marketer's um, skill sets. Yeah. Like what's happening in the world, trying different things. I ballroom dance too, by the way. Uh, so lots of different things give us new experiences, which then add to what we bring to the table for organizations that we work for, work with. Um, and this is something that's all of us should do. I think being able, I, I mean, in Canada, you know, if I was there, I would love to go out and play, have a snow fight with somebody. It's building a rich life for yeah. yourself, um, which ultimately then adds to uh, being a better marketing professional. Yes, that's very right. So where can our viewers find you and connect with you? They can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I've been told when if you type Adrian Hang in LinkedIn, they will find me very quickly and very easily. Um, I'm pretty open to adding people. Uh, I, I think not as ego thing, but I think meeting as many people uh, and knowing as many people is a benefit for me. And you know, whenever I open a new market, whenever I launch a brand in a new market, it's nice to know somebody in that market. And you know, today they might help me when I'm launching a brand, but tomorrow when yeah. they are trying to come into Singapore, or somewhere in Southeast Asia, or somewhere I've worked with, I'm happy to um, return the favor. Quite noted. I'm coming to Singapore. <laughs> Sounds good. Let me know when you are. We'll 
go coffee or dinner or lunch. Hopefully soon. Yeah, hopefully yes. soon. So thank you so much, Adrian, for your time on the show and great tips to the young marketing professionals. Thank you. <laughs> to all our viewers, thanks for listening and please subscribe to this channel. If you enjoyed this episode and you will like to help and support this podcast, please share it with your friends, post about it on social media or leave a rating and review. I'll see you next time in a new episode with a new speaker. Till then, peace.